see. That, you know, the original is not the digital. So, you know, I extended the invitation to the professor Michael, and he said, sure, we'll come. So that's how he ended up here. And um, so, again, I'll let Professor Winkle basically go for it. So he's, he'll be speaking tonight, and then his project will be speaking tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. I had no idea why you chose me to speak tonight, but I'm delighted that you did. When I came into the hall this evening, one member of the audience came up, shook my hand, introduced himself, and congratulated me on being so brave as to come before a Washington, D.C. audience to talk about the history of Washington, D.C. <laughs> I kind of suspect the more appropriate word that he had in mind was foolhardy <laughs> rather than brave. But I hope that my remarks this evening will make clear to you why I and my colleagues at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln are so committed to studying the history of Washington, D.C. during the Civil War. Among American cities during the Civil War, the situation of Washington was truly unique and pivotal to the conduct and outcome of that military conflict. Washington's provost marshal called it the most prized and most hated city in America during the Civil War. In one of the war's greatest ironies, the capital of the Union and the focus of its military effort was a southern slave-owning city that was sandwiched between two southern slave states that were themselves at war with one another situated between Virginia, the most populous Confederate state, and Maryland, which remained in the Union, albeit tenuously, Washington sat literally on the front line of attack against Richmond, the Confederate capital just 100 miles away. Throughout the war, Washington faced ceaseless threats from both directions, front and rear. General Robert E. Lee's army of Northern Virginia launched major offensive against Washington for three summers in succession. The Antietam Campaign in 1862, the Gettysburg Campaign in 1863, and Jubal Early's raid against Washington and Maryland in 1864. From the rear in Maryland, Confederate sympathizers cut lines of communication and supply, engaged in sabotage and espionage, and gave aid and comfort to the enemy whenever possible. Guerrilla actions in both Maryland and occupied Virginia targeted Union troops on both sides of the Potomac. Even after the experience of the British occupation during war, uh, the War of 1812, of which we are celebrating the 200th anniversary this year, The war, they, right, the occupation is next year. Thank you. <laughs> Feel free to shout out. You, you can't stop us. I won't try. Congressional inaction left the city entirely undefended. Many doubters considered it indefensible, especially with secessionist southern Maryland to its rear. The city was truly isolated, with its three main connections to the outside, the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad, the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal, and the Potomac River all vulnerable. And they were all blocked or sabotaged and unusable for long stretches at some point during the war. There were no fortifications. Fort Washington, 15 miles down the Potomac, was unmanned. 
The Union Army had no more than 15,000 men with virtually no troops in Washington. General in Chief Winfield Scott was counting on the Marine Band to fight if necessary. <laughs> In the week after Fort Sumter, Lincoln watched from the White House window in vain before Northern troops, the 7th New York Infantry, arrived at last. He stood at the window asking, why don't they come? In the midst of this crisis, the veterans of the War of 1812 organized to help defend the city. Much of the Washington militia was disloyal. Winfield Scott considered one-third of the militiamen secessionists. The ironically named National Rifles, consisting of government employees, was heavily secessionist in sympathies. All but 50 members resigned and reformed in Virginia. They fought at the first battle of Bull Run as the Beauregard Rifles. Federal officials from Maryland planned to support the Confederacy or to resign if that state seceded. And indeed, General Scott's own chief of staff joined the Confederacy. Initially, there were, was only one hospital to treat the wounded. The city infirmary, which was a charitable institution, and it promptly burned down at the beginning of the war. Eventually, the government erected over 100 military hospitals in the District of Columbia to treat the casualties in the Eastern Theater. Sabotage, including arson, was rampant. Among other targets, the Army's primary stable which contained thousands of horses, burned down early in the war. And the White House stables burned down toward the end. This was the Washington that Lincoln encountered when he arrived in March 1861. We have all heard the unfortunate account of Lincoln entering the city by railroad unannounced in the middle of the night for fear of assassination. His and the city's survival was all too precarious. Out of this inauspicious beginning, three divergent and conflicting perspectives on the value of Washington, D.C. to both supporters and opponents of the Union emerged and competed for supremacy for the rest of the Civil War. First, abolitionists, African Americans, and many radical Republicans saw the potential of the city to become the entering wedge of reform across the South, leading eventually to emancipation and an expansion of civil rights. Sectional tension over slavery was endemic to Washington from its very founding. Long before the war, the city was the target of northern reformers, particularly abolitionists. Upon arriving as First Lady in 1801, for example, Abigail Adams promptly wrote contemptuously that the effects of slavery are everywhere. During the 1830s, abolitionists identified Washington as the grand point of attack in any effort to end slavery in America, almost as if ending slavery in Washington would lead inevitably to its national downfall. Among southern cities, Washington was alone in enjoying a strong northern presence before the war primarily government appointees and congressional delegations who descended on the city every December and virtually ran it for the next six months. They supported a long-standing anti-slavery movement in the city that began in 1804 
and produced a welter of emancipation proposals, including the one that Abraham Lincoln himself crafted while serving in Congress in 1849. Abolitionists from New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Vermont, many of them Quakers and other evangelical Protestant sects, organized and funded a handful of abolition societies in the city. From 1846 to 1859, Gamaliel Bailey, who had been driven out of Cincinnati because of his abolitionism, published an anti-slavery newspaper, the Washington National Era, which was most famous for publishing Harriet Beecher Stowe's serialized novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, in 1851. That was first published in Washington. And Washington even boasted an underground railroad, the nation's first, to channel fugitive slaves to Canada. All of these anti-slavery efforts were unique for a southern slave-owning city and, of course, provoked better reaction. Meanwhile, slavery was gradually deteriorating in Washington, and a large free African-American population arose, the second largest in the nation behind Baltimore's. The rising African-American community created its own network of churches and a privately funded school system. Promoting emancipation and civil rights, they provided an experienced wartime and later post-war leadership that included the Cook family, who numbered two Presbyterian ministers, the Syfax family, former slaves of the Lees at Arlington House across the Potomac, and the Reverend Henry Highland Garnett, the first African American to address the U.S. House of Representatives. So even before the war began, Washington, D.C. was already a battleground between the North and the South and between slavery and freedom, with a wartime leadership, both black and white, already organized and mobilized to pursue emancipation and equal rights. During the war, northern reformers poured into Washington and tried to remake it into a northern city. They advocated emancipation as a war aim and as an indispensable weapon in fighting the Confederacy and therefore reuniting the country. Eminent northerners who visited or even relocated to the capital included Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman, Clara Barton, Dorothea Dix, Walt Whitman, Harriet Beecher Stowe, and Louisa May Alcott. The Massachusetts Senator Charles Sumner hoped that the District of Columbia would become an example for all the land, a moral exemplar for what a United Nation could achieve. And here on the slide, we see in the upper left, Sojourner Truth, most notable for working as a teacher at the Freedmen's Village at Arlington and waging the so-called streetcar fight. To get to Arlington, she had to take the streetcar over the Potomac. It was segregated. There was one car for African Americans, and she and others successfully fought to integrate Washington streetcars. In the lower left, Charles Sumner, probably the most eloquent and effective abolitionist who served in Congress during the Civil War. He was constantly 
critical of Lincoln's slowness in embracing emancipation, but Lincoln once told him, the difference between you and me is six weeks. Six weeks from now, I will be where you are at this time. So be patient was the message. I'm coming. At the top is a group of so-called contrabands, fugitive slaves fleeing Virginia. They're slave owners for freedom. But below that is the first colored infantry regiment of the District of Columbia. The, the district raised two regiments beginning in 1863, and they mustered and drilled on what is now Theodore Roosevelt Island in the Potomac. In the upper right is Frederick Douglass. Lincoln told him, I may move slowly toward emancipation, but once I move forward, I never move backward. And that proved true. And in the lower right are contrabands, fugitive slaves who were employed in the army. They were not made soldiers until 1863. But this was a way to contribute to the war effort and to receive federal protection and to become free. Southerners, many of them, viewed Washington as a valuable enclave of Confederate activity that could strike at the heart of the Union war effort. Many Southern sympathizers in Washington, 90% of the city's pre-war residents were born in the South. This was truly a Southern city attempted to prevent or delay emancipation. And the most dangerous of them supported the Confederacy, surreptitiously undermining the Union war effort in any way they could as spies, saboteurs, and suppliers of both contraband material and sensitive information. Many pre-war Washingtonians supported secession, including the mayor, and the former mayor and much of the police force and a substantial portion of the city's economic elite who had close ties to the South. So a resistance movement of sorts operated throughout the war, undermining the Union military effort and opposing emancipation and other reforms, culminating in Lincoln's assassination just five days after Lee's surrender. When the war began, hundreds of secessionists left voluntarily, while many more were forced out of the city and their government jobs by the imposition of a loyalty oath. The most fanatical, like John Wilkes Booth, devoted their lives to turning Washington into an enemy enclave. The most dangerous, and Booth is an exemplar, hid in plain sight, doing nothing to arouse suspicion, and slipping in and out of Washington at will for the city's poorest defenses. Many Southern sympathizers hoped that the Confederacy would overrun Washington early in the war and make it the secesh capital. This belief or threat was summed up in an anecdote popular in Washington at the time. An Episcopal minister fled to the Confederacy, and he was so confident that he would return very soon that he locked his cat in the cellar with enough food to last until the Confederate army could capture the city. Three, three months later, according to the Evening Star, 
the minister's cellar was opened and the poor cat was found in a pitiable condition. The star likened the cat to the Confederacy. <laughs> confined and half-starved, but still alive. After refusing to swear to the loyalty oath, the city's mayor was arrested, and it was a secret arrest for disloyalty, and he was forced to resign. He fled the city for the remainder of the war. The most notorious dissenters were literally drummed out in a periodic rogues march, very publicly, that was conducted by the military authorities on a regular basis. And hundreds more found themselves languishing in the old capital prison, awaiting military tribunals with no juries. During the four years of war, the old capital hosted more than 30,000 military and political prisoners, the so-called prisoners of war and the prisoners of state. The prison typically held 1,000 prisoners at a time, but swelled to almost 3,000 at its peak. Washington's provost marshal likened it to a rat trap easy to enter, but almost impossible to exit. And here we see, in the upper left, in floating in the Potomac, the government established the Potomac Flotilla. One of its main jobs was to keep Confederate sympathizers from crossing the Potomac or sending things across the Potomac, such as mail, uh, drugs, quinine, uh, and other items that the Confederacy needed. Um, and this is an infernal machine that was designed to thwart the Potomac flotilla. In the lower left is Rose Greenhow, who took credit for conveying important information to General Beauregard before the first battle of Bull Run, essentially giving him foreknowledge of the Union's plan of attack. This is Rose Greenhow and her daughter languishing in the old Capitol prison and her daughter came with her. At the top, of course, is Arlington House, the Lee's Mansion right across the river, um, a symbol of the defiance of Virginia in their secession from the Union. And then underneath is the Long Bridge across the Potomac, looking out at Virginia a constant warning that this is the enemy. And I'm, I'm sure many of you know the story about the flag flying over the Marshall House in Alexandria and Elmer Ellsworth's courageous effort uh, to bring it down. In the upper right, it's, it's Duff Green. He was a relative of Abraham Lincoln. That, I think, is little known, unless you all want to shout out. I knew that. <laughs> he was the uncle of Mary Lincoln's brother-in-law. But the Lincolns lived in Duff Green's Row when Lincoln came to Washington as a congressman. They knew Duff Green well. With secession, Green went to live in Georgia. He was very wealthy. He owned mines and iron mills that produced one third of the iron that the Confederacy used to make weapons, railroads, and horseshoes. 
during the war. He never came back to Washington. The government confiscated Duff Green's row, which we'll hear about uh, uh, just a bit later. And in the lower right is uh, James B Barrett, the mayor of Washington, who refused to take the oath, was arrested and displaced. And he went to New York City for the duration of the war. strategic value of the city was Lincoln's. Washington was a citadel that was indispensable to the war effort and the defense of the Union. Throughout the war, Lincoln considered Washington a strategic military stronghold, the most strategic stronghold in the Union, the most important military target of the Confederate armies, a vital staging area for troops, weapons, and supplies, only 100 miles from the Confederate capital, the unifying political center of the Union is the national capital, and a symbol of national unity, Republican government, the democratic process, and the rule of law. His paramount priorities for Washington at the outset of the Civil War were to hold the city, defend it, control it, use it to attack the Confederacy, and make it a symbol of national resolve and renewal. He declared, I must have troops to defend this capital. And he insisted on maintaining an army of 15 to 50,000 men in and around Washington, often to the dismay of his generals who coveted these reinforcements. He oversaw construction of a ring of fortifications around the city that eventually included 68 forts connected by 20 miles of trenches and including 93 artillery positions that boasted 800 cannon. By the end of the war, Washington was the most heavily fortified city on Earth. And as we all know, it, those defenses fended off one attack at Fort Stevens quite successfully. As his wartime population tripled, Washington fell under a military occupation dedicated to keeping the city under Union control. The federal government took over the police force and purged it of disloyal officers. Provost marshals dispensed justice among both soldiers and civilians. The government established a curfew and a host of other civil regulations to impose order. A plainclothes detective bureau that evolved into the Secret Service monitored virtually every aspect of everyday life in the city. The ubiquity of the plainclothes police became apparent when they began monitoring and arresting each other. <laughs> Lincoln called this process of imposing order cleaning the devil out of Washington. Lincoln not only ensured the security of the capital, but turned its proximity to the war to his own advantage. As commander-in-chief, he developed a hands-on approach to military strategy, making 13 trips to visit his commanders in the field in Virginia. On these visits to the front, Lincoln spent up to a week advising his generals, raising morale by reviewing and rallying the troops, visiting the wounded, and emphasizing his practical and symbolic engagement with the armies as a visible proponent of national resolve. On one occasion, he gained personal insight into the sacrifices the war entailed by witnessing firsthand the burial of the dead on the battlefield. Lincoln envisioned Washington as a key symbol of the American nation, 
He worked diligently to turn that idea into a reality. He continually rallied the troops, met White House visitors by the thousands, comforted wounded soldiers in hospitals, and consoled their families through his eloquent letters. He patronized the theaters to help maintain the city's and his own morale, and through his very accessibility in the wartime city, put his own life at risk to set the right example. I've been struck by the number of chance encounters Lincoln had with the citizens of Washington that I think made a very genuine and important impact on his view of the war and the nation itself. He used the city to take what he called public opinion baths in which he would meet ordinary people and hear them speak their minds. One Northern War correspondent reported that she was walking between the White House and the War Department and was surprised to see the President sitting on the ground under a tree with a soldier. The soldier was doing all the talking and Lincoln was listening intently. On another occasion, according to the Evening Star, Lincoln's military escort was assembling across the street from the White House in Lafayette Square when a woman walked up and, in the star's words, with a pink calico scarf thrown gracefully over her shoulder and the end waved in her right hand for oratorical effect, lectured in loud tones for 10 minutes denouncing the president, blackguarding the soldiers, and extolling Jefferson Davis. <laughs> she was not arrested. The most poignant chance encounter I've uncovered, however, was Lincoln meeting with Frederick Douglass at the White House in the morning and then later the same day, according to the records of the Riggs Bank, wrote a check to a man he encountered on the street for $5. And the check was made out simply to, quote, colored man with one leg. No one knows the story of who he was or why Lincoln wrote him a check for what it's worth Five dollars then was the equivalent of about two hundred dollars today. But Lincoln overall learned a lot from meeting and listening to people on the streets of Washington, including those he met by chance. He also insisted that public improvements proceed as scheduled, particularly the completion of the unfinished dome of the Capitol building capped fittingly by the bronze statue of freedom to mark the city as a visible national symbol. And here we have, in the upper left, Edwin Stanton, um, the arbitrary arrest, as they're called, of secessionists in Washington was originally overseen by the State Department. William Henry Seward was later transferred to Edwin Stanton, and he was much more vigorous and much more thorough in making those arrests. In the lower left are Union troops guarding the Capitol building. At the top is the unfinished dome of the Capitol, soon to be finished with the Statue of Freedom, set gently at its top. Below that is the White House uh, with the statue of Thomas Jefferson in the oval in front, which is no longer there. 
upper right is Lincoln Hospital. And you'll hear, if you come at 9.30 tomorrow, you'll hear more about the hospitals. Um, it's a pavilion hospital designed and built to be a Civil War hospital. And you'll hear why and how that happened uh, tomorrow morning. Below that is Alan Pinkerton, who came to Washington. The government hired him as his chief detective. Oddly, he used a pseudonym. He came and called himself E.J. Allen. So it's kind of layer upon layer of secrecy. And finally is the old Capitol prison itself across the street uh, from the Capitol building. In administering Washington, Lincoln stood in the middle of the spectrum between the entering wedge and the enemy enclave. He attempted to maintain his vision of a citadel by balancing and tempering those two extremes with Washington, the pivot point in between them. The best example of the kind of balancing act that Lincoln attempted, and the most important issue that he confronted during the war, of course, was emancipation. The evolution of emancipation in Washington was not only a microcosm of the process that unfolded on a national scale, but it actually occurred sooner and faster and was even more conceptually complex than uh, elsewhere. Washington began the war with 11,000 African Americans, about one-fifth of whom were slaves. When Lincoln arrived, he was conciliatory towards slave owners in Washington. He assured the mayor, whom he later arrested, that he had no intention of attacking slavery. He announced, quote, I have not now any purpose to withhold from you any of the benefits of the Constitution under any circumstances. Significantly, he said, I have not now any purpose. Because, of course, emancipation became a military necessity as well as a moral imperative. Eventually, the war brought more fugitive slaves to Washington than to any other point in the nation, perhaps 40,000 of them. Most came from Virginia and Maryland. At the outset of the war, all of them were considered fugitives under the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850. Lincoln initially enforced the Fugitive Slave Law. He had always promised the South that he would do that if he was elected president, and he did. When radicals in Congress objected, Lincoln pointed out, it's the law. I'm sworn to enforce it. If you don't like the law, Congress should repeal it. Congress did not repeal the Fugitive Slave Law until 1864. Accordingly, at the beginning of the war, when fugitive slaves arrived, they were arrested and thrown into jail. They were criminals. In May 1861, however, General Benjamin Butler, who commanded Fortress Monroe at Hampton, Virginia, developed the so-called contraband policy. Slaves who fled from their owners in seceded states were declared contraband of war. They were harbored by the army and put to work for wages in a form of quasi-freedom. Legally, they became the property of the federal government. They came to be known as contrabands. After the Lincoln administration endorsed this contraband policy, fugitive slaves began pouring into Washington, expecting to be treated as contrabands there, too. Initially, they were arrested and thrown into the city jail. Most of the prisoners in the jail were, in fact, fugitive slaves, 
So the jail was known as the slave pen. But soon the government extended the contraband policy to Washington and later the entire South. Slaves from Virginia were put under military protection and began working for wages. This policy supported Lincoln's goal of prosecuting the war against the Confederacy as effectively as possible. Another goal, however, was keeping Maryland in the Union. So slaves from Maryland were still returned to their owners. So Washington had two distinct policies towards slaves. Fugitives from Virginia became contrabands, while fugitives from Maryland remain slaves. The first question a fugitive slave was asked is, where are you from? So Lincoln performed a balancing act between Virginia and Maryland, confiscating slaves from Virginia as part of the war effort, while returning fugitive slaves back to Maryland slave owners. That's part of keeping Maryland in the Union. Well, this process was modified in August 1861 when Congress passed the first Confiscation Act, under which disloyal Southerners forfeited their slaves, whether they lived in seceded states or not. So now, when a fugitive slave arrived from Maryland, the first question asked was, where are you from? The second question was, is your owner loyal? Usually the answer was no. <laughs> Those slaves also became contrabands. At this point, the provost marshals began arresting police officers who seized and returned any fugitive slaves to Maryland without a court order. So in effect, the government began privileging freedom over slavery. If you're here, you're free unless someone can prove otherwise. So by the end of 1861, the District of Columbia had indeed become an entering wedge of freedom within the slave South. Beyond the contrabands, tens of thousands of them, the District of Columbia itself numbered 3,000 slaves. When the war began, the African American community, abolitionists, and radicals in Congress demanded unconditional emancipation for those slaves. Lincoln offered conditional emancipation. There were four conditions. Freeing the slaves had to be gradual. It had to be voluntary. The slave owners had to willingly give them up. And the next condition is emancipation had to be compensated. The government, in fact, would buy those slaves and set them free. And the fourth condition was Congress would fund a colonization program. This was essentially the emancipation plan that he had proposed as a congressman in 1849. He had also proposed it to Maryland and the other border states. He wanted it put into effect in Washington to set an example for those border states in hopes that they would see the result and voluntarily free their own slaves. Congress, however, insisted on unconditional emancipation. So Lincoln compromised and dropped two of his conditions. When Congress enacted the Compensated Emancipation Act, in April of 1862, which we heard about earlier, in which all of us will celebrate next year, it included 
compensation and funding for colonization, but it was not gradual and it was not voluntary. This was the act that freed all 3,000 slaves in the district nine months before the Emancipation Proclamation took effect. It was another victory for the entering wedge that Lincoln tempered to balance the interests of security against those of freedom. The first contrabands were lodged in the city jail. In March 1862, however, Lincoln appointed an abolitionist to be the military governor of the District of Columbia. That abolitionist, James Wadsworth, moved the contrabands from the city jail to the old Capitol prison. Well, you may ask, so they went from municipal jurisdiction into federal jurisdiction. From there, the federal government created a series of increasingly commodious and healthy contraband camps. First, moving the contrabands into Duff's Green, Duff Green's Row, ironically where Lincoln had lived when he was a member of Congress, then into Camp Barker on the edge of the city, a camp of tents, open-air tents, a square block in size, and finally to Arlington with the creation of Arlington Freedman's Village, which provided a model for similar Freedman's Villages across the South, and made Arlington House, the Lee Mansion, a symbol of emancipation. And here we have, in the upper left, Duff Green's Row, it sat across the street from the Capitol. It was confiscated from Duff Green and fittingly turned into a house of freedom for the contrabands. In the lower left is William Slade. He was Abraham Lincoln's confidential messenger a position of great trust. Among other distinctions, Abraham Lincoln read a copy of the Emancipation Proclamation to William Slade before he presented it to his cabinet. In the center, bottom center, is Arlington Freedman's Village, which actually operated until 1890. In the upper right, Francis Carpenter's rendering of the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. And in the lower right is Henry Highland Garnett, the first African American to speak before the US House of Representatives in February 1865. Throughout the war, oops, throughout the war, Lincoln moved deliberately in creating a policy that he believed would ultimately lead to freedom in an effort to balance the demands of fugitive slaves, abolitionists, and radical Republicans on the one hand, and pro-slavery advocates, particularly slave owners in Washington and Maryland on the other, without endangering the safety of Washington or its effectiveness as a citadel at the center of the Union military effort. This perpetual balancing act at which Lincoln was masterful 
allowed him to fulfill four of his five goals for Washington as a citadel of the Union. Throughout the war, he held the city, defended it, used it to attack the Confederacy, and he did make it an enduring symbol of national resolve and renewal. But he was never able to control the city completely as his assassination five days after Lee's surrender signifies. Everyone who knew Lincoln has testified that his own personal safety was the least of his concerns. Thank you. And I do want to credit the Library of Congress and Harper's Weekly Online for those beautiful digital images that you saw in my PowerPoint. Yes? Uh, I just have one uh, outstanding question. Uh, with respect to the fortification, and it seems there was a sort of delay from the beginning of the war until they were in place. And I really have always thought of Lee as such a mastermind. Why didn't he attack? I'll refer to our digital project. We have a map. If you come in at 9.30 tomorrow morning, you'll see it, in which we map the appearance of the fortifications. And there's a pattern to them. When there's a perceived threat, the fortifications come up in that uh, on that direction from Washington. So the first perceived threat was from the southeast, from Virginia. Then there was a perceived threat, at least, from Maryland, from the rear, and those go up. Then when the Confederacy built ironclad vessels, the Union worried was to stop them just from sailing up the Potomac, sitting um, at the edge of the river, and just shelling Washington at will. So those fortifications go up. Finally, the idea arose, the attack will come from the north. And those went up. And of course, as we all know, Jubal Early's attack did come from the north up through Maryland. But you can see that if you come tomorrow morning. <laughs> we all have a we all have a burst of adrenaline going for us. I hope you do too. Oh, thank you. Yeah. what historians call a contrafactual question, and we're not supposed to answer. <laughs> However, that's one thing that made Washington such a wonderful citadel, that it was so close to the war. And I don't want to make you know, too far-flung an analogy, but some of the best battles in the Civil War were fought when an army had its back to the river and it could not retreat. Washington could not retreat. That's just a simple way of putting that. Yes? Uh, I really love your talk. Oh, thank you. Uh, and I appreciate your discussion of D.C. as a symbolic uh, space for location. And I was really interested in part of what you were talking about was sort of this incredible uh, 
certainly indirect legacies, one of which, of course, is after the war, Washington lost its self-government. The government was federalized. In fact, this is called the territorial period of Washington history. Washington, the District of Columbia was essentially treated as an unorganized territory, like those in the West, and directly controlled by Congress. Well, they got used to doing that during the war. Um, from a national perspective, presidential war powers came out of the Civil War. And much of that came directly out of Washington, D.C. Legal scholars have looked in vain for any reference to presidential war powers. They're not in the Constitution. It doesn't say that. But Lincoln invoked them. He invented the phrase, war, the war powers of the president, and put them into action. Of course, we can argue he had to. What was his alternative? As we all know, after the Civil War, the Supreme Court retroactively ruled unconstitutional many of Lincoln's actions as president. In the Milligan decision, which has been, which has been virtually ignored ever since. Yes. I could quip that we live in Lincoln, Nebraska for a reason. <laughs> but Lincoln has a long tradition, the University of Nebraska at Lincoln, a long tradition of studying the Civil War and Abraham Lincoln and doing an outstanding job of that. Uh, so we have a history of doing that, I'll put it that way. Yes. Uh, you mentioned that you talked about two black regiments that were formed. Yes. And there, you said there were only 3,000 slaves in D.C. Were those, yes. Were those, those slaves, did those slaves end up as part of the regiment, or there were, were there a lot of free men living in the district that became those regiments? Both. And the way regiments were organized, you didn't need to be a member of that community or a resident of that state or that place to join a regiment. So there was a lot of contrabands in that too? And so there were a lot of the so-called contrabands as well. But how many, what percentage of the city was uh, African American at that time? You know? About one sixth uh, of the city. And then most, of that, most of them were free? Most of them were free men then? Yes. Slavery had declined really ever since Washington was founded. It peaked in the 1830s and then began declining, in part because so many of the slaves ran away that slave, slave owners were insecure. They felt insecure, they were insecure. But the sad part of it is they sold their slaves southward to the New Orleans market. So the decline of slavery in Washington emphasizes the vulnerability of that African-American community as so many of its members were sold, as the popular phrase put it, down the river. Yes? Uh, you mentioned the DC militia. Is that what you call constantly green? Uh, in Well, they did that, and there was such a fear of assassination. The city also had a very had 100 police officers for a city of 60,000 people. They imported police, quote unquote, from Baltimore for that occasion. They also planted plain clothes detectives in the audience 
there was a threat that a group of men in the audience at a predetermined time would rush up the steps of the Capitol and kill Lincoln. And so they were playing clothes police and detectives watching the crowd to make sure that that didn't happen. It sounds like a militia. Was the purges, I mean, how did they know the people okay. were to be loyal and not just the assassins themselves? Do you have any idea? The purges came through loyalty oaths. The federal government required the city police to take a loyalty oath. And it was called the ironclad oath. They had to promise to defend the Constitution against all enemies. And I've really been struck by the effectiveness of the oaths. Confederate sympathizers preferred to, le to lose their jobs and leave Washington rather than to swear to and sign that oath. So, in effect, they were entirely candid about what their intentions were. Yes? I'm a little, uh, um, I have a contradiction going on in my mind here. Uh, you know, the total disregard that Lincoln had was only 18. And I look at that in contrast to uh, the war powers Late in the war, when he faced that criticism, he wrote a letter. And here's Abraham Lincoln. I'm going to write it down and make it pithy, and it's going to last forever, explaining why he violated some parts of the Constitution. He openly admitted. And the basic question he asked is, how can I Okay, I'm trying to not do injustice to Lincoln. The way he put it was, shall we enforce all of the laws so that all of them will be overturned and have no force? There are times when we must violate a few laws or a few constitutional clauses to save the entire document. This is what he told Congress on July 4th, 1861, and they voted overwhelmingly to support his violations of the Constitution, and in effect made them legal thereby. So they agreed with him. Congress, the representatives, agreed with that point of view about the Constitution. The Supreme Court did not, however. I'm sorry? It's a sticky one. Yes, it is. But Lincoln faced those sticky ones um, throughout the war. Well, I really enjoyed speaking with you and meeting you. said, what's the title of your talk? And I gave him the title of the book I'm writing. So I'm writing a book, Lincoln's Citadel, The Civil War in Washington, D.C. It will come out in about a year from W.W. Norton and Company. And this is the first sneak preview that anyone has received. So I hope it went over well. <laughs>